Amen. Good to be here. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give me the gift of teaching, open our hearts to receive your word. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 1, and then John chapter number 8 and verse number 58. John 1, 1, John 8, 58. As you know, John's last gospel written, and it is the gospel specifically written to Gentiles, to the world for that matter, not just Gentiles, to everyone. The purpose of the gospel of John is to fill in the void left when the kingdom of heaven was uh, uh, placed in abeyance and the kingdom of God was now prominent and God had called the Apostle Paul to preach to the Gentiles. It's un very important to understand the dispensational aspect of the New Testament and the whole Bible for that matter. And if you don't, then uh, you will forever be butting heads against scriptures and doctrines and there will always be confusion. Look at what it says in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Logos. Now, the Apostle John has been accused of using the same terminology as Plato and the rest of the Gnostics and Neoplatonists and so forth, Philo and the rest of them down there in North Africa in his day. And the reason they accuse him of that is because they think that John is really a closet Gnostic and that he's trying to merge Christianity with Gnosticism. There's some out there that teach that. And it's a bunch of garbage, folks. But this is the thing you get into when you start studying the Bible. If they, can, if they can diminish the scripture in any way, then they're going to diminish your faith. They're going to destroy it. There is no question John is different. He is different. And the reason John is different is because John is written now for people all over this world through all the generations that are to follow the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish kingdom, the Jewish Messiah and all of that that came and uh, had its time. And, and was put into abeyance. Now the church of God and the kingdom of God is preached. And the apostle Paul is preaching it. And he's preaching the deity of Christ. John and Paul, if two ever lived on this earth, who preached the deity of Christ, it is John and Paul. Look at it, John eight fifty eight. John chapter 8 and verse number 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And now that's a direct quotation from the book of Exodus. When Moses said, who will I tell them sent me? He said, you tell them I am hath sent you. And then if you'll turn over here to the gospel of John chapter number 9 and verse number 35. John nine thirty-five. Jesus heard they had cast him out, and when he'd found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, if your Bible doesn't say Son of God here, if that text is left out, you need a Bible. Amen. That's a simple, you know. Somebody said, Are you a King James? I'm a Bible man. <laughs> I want the Bible, not parts of it. Not where it's been uh, chopped up and whole portions of it thrown away. I want the book. And uh, so in John eight fifty eight, he said, uh, I am that I am. And then in John chapter number 9, verse number 35, he said, do you believe in the Son of God? Verse 37, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now, of course, Matthew and uh, Luke have a genealogy. Matthew's genealogy is the royal genealogy of the house of David. And Luke's genealogy is the genealogy of mankind, leading all the way back to God the Creator. And Adam is the son of God because God was his father. God had made Adam. But he was the son of God in a different sense than Christ is the son of God. He's the son of God in a different sense that you and I are sons of God. Adam was a son of God by creation. Christ is a son of God by essence. And you and I are the son of God by the new birth. See what I mean? Angels are sons of God because they are created beings in the Old Testament. 
So, you know, one size does not fit all. I know it, I know it's, it, it, people like to make things easy and keep it simple, but the Bible's not a simple book. The Bible's a very complex book because it manifests the mind of God. So it's very important to understand these things. In the 1800s, a Russian lived by the name of Notovich. If you'll remember a few months ago, I mentioned him to you. Notovich, he was a Russian. He traveled to India. It's said that he did. He traveled to India and went into some of the monasteries over there and said that he saw some, uh, some, uh, uh, some old documents that purported to say that Christ had been there when he was uh, a young man between the ages of 12 and 30. That these silent years of 18 silent years between 12 and 30, and this is one of the biggest controversial things on the internet and has been for 2,000 years, where was Christ, what was he doing for these 18 silent years? Well, the Bible doesn't say, and so that's good enough for me. If the scripture wanted us to know, if there was some, something, then we'd know it. But the scripture doesn't say, it's, it's silent. So I leave it at that. But this man teaches, or taught back then, that Christ went to India. And while he was there in India, he sat at the feet of a guru. A guru in Hinduism is a teacher. Every Hindu has a guru. And so he sat at the feet of a guru and learned the great mystical uh, 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 secrets of the initiation into Hinduism, Buddhism, and all of that, hidden knowledge. And when he came back to the Holy Land, all the miracles he performed and everything he did, he did it. He did it because he was an avatar, or he was an ascended master, or he was some kind of a title that Hinduism or Buddhism puts on him. And so, of course, what that does is it says that Hinduism, Buddhism, Brahmism, and all of that is superior to Christianity because Christ learned everything he knows from these people. Now, this uh, understandably caused an uproar. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, Christians across the country, apologist. A Christian apologist is one who defends the faith. That's an apologist. They're not apologizing for anything. The word simply means he is one who defends the faith. And there's a lot of good ones out there. A polemicist is one who attacks another in defense of the faith. So you have a polemic, they call it, where it's a document someone writes that is attacking someone's attack of Christ. That's a polemic. An apologist is one who gathers together the information and defends the faith. As Jude said, to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. So therefore, it's our place as a minister, a pastor, it's my job, and I know God will hold me accountable to defend the faith once delivered to the saints. I'm accountable. Uh, you know, I can't just fly from one state to the next state, fly here and fly there. I am right here on Woodrow Drive. And people are watching me every week, and they're listening to what I say. And, you know, am I going to support the truth? Am I going to defend the truth? Am I going to do what I'm supposed to do? And that's what I'm accountable for. That's what a pastor does. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to defend the faith. Now, there is no faith outside of Christ. Amen. It doesn't exist. It's just a meaningless bunch of religious uh, uh, rabble. It has no meaning. If it's not the Lord Jesus Christ as the absolute rock and foundation of it, the center of it, then it's meaningless. So when Notovich did this, he attacked Christ. He attacked him. And, uh, and the apologist came out, and I mean, they worked him over well and did a fine job. And that's a study. If you want to do a little research on your own to give you just a little bit of time to get into stuff like this, look up Notovich, N-O-T-A-V-I-C-H. Uh, I don't remember his first name. Uh, could have been Vladimir or something like that. He's a Russian. And, uh, and look his name up and see the controversy that took place. And then see how it was answered. And it's all over the internet. It's everywhere. It would be easy to find the information. And they tore him apart. And the reason they took Notovich apart is because everything he said was based on his own speculation. With no, the, They never could produce the document. They could never produce the document that Christ was supposed to have gone to India, you know, recorded 2,000 years ago how he went to India and sat at the feet of a guru, they never could produce it. They went to the same monastery that Nadovich said he went to and saw all of this, and the people running the monastery said, we've never heard of him. So, you know, they did the work. They did the research. 
The apologists went after him, and God blessed them, and they did their job, and they exposed him for the fraud that he was. But he got a lot of, he got a lot of notoriety for that. You know, it's, it's like a person comes along today, still to this day, when somebody says, I'm an atheist. <gasps> Everybody's, you know, oh, did you know so-and-so is an atheist? Well, he gets, he gets the attention he wants. He or she is getting the attention that they desire because they claim to be an atheist. It's about Christ, folks. Who is he? Who is this? What manner of man is this, the Jews said 2,000 years ago? What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey his word? Who is this man? Well, folks, I cannot emphasize enough to you this morning this fact. The Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely the glue, the foundation, the web, the webbing, everything that holds us together is the Son of God. If we lose our perspective and understanding of Him, then we're going to float off into everything under the sun. And you live in an age where you are being bombarded daily with Eastern mysticism, New Age movement, and all this other stuff that goes along with it. And they are undermining your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're not doing it from out there. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. It's coming from the very church house itself. And it's coming from the pulpits in America. They're undermining the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me give you a little, a, a little clue that I've learned after years and years of, of, of living for the Lord, walking with God, and reading His Word. Yet just listen. Just focus yourself on that individual. He may say, he or she, or they may say a lot of good sounding things. But after you've listened to them for about 30 or 45 minutes, or you've been around them a while, ask yourself this simple question. Am I thinking about the Lord Jesus, or am I thinking about them? Has the focus here been on Christ, or is the focus on their ministry, or their movement, or their or their achievements, or, or, or anything. I don't care what. And it can be good things. It can be good things. But Christ must have the preeminence. Amen. Amen. Folks, that's important. <laughs> he absolutely must have the preeminence. I listened to a man the other night on television, and he went through a long litany of all the things that he'd sacrificed to get to where he was. And I thought to myself, you know, the Apostle Paul did that one time in the book of 2 Corinthians. He said that. He, get, he, said, he said, I was shipwrecked. I was beaten with frauds five times, save one, 40 stripes. He said, I was in perils of false brethren, perils of false countrymen, a night and a day in the deep and all of this. He said, but if you go back and read that text, here's what he said. I speak as a fool. That's what he said of himself when he said that. He said, if you want to brag, I'll brag. He said, I can brag as much as any of you can. He said, I was the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day. You know, as, as far as the righteousness of the law, here's what he said about that. He said, blameless, even though he was guilty of blood. So it's his understanding and take on what the righteousness of the law represented. That's an interesting thought right there. But anyway, he said, as far as the righteousness of the law is concerned, blameless. He said, I count all of that, but... <laughs> That's what he said. He said, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. Until you have your head shot up, blown off like Marjorie Browning did, I don't want to hear you. <laughs> right? Life's hard for all of us. Good night, man. When you watch your wife lay all day long with a broken hip, crying, and then take her to the emergency room, and then they do surgery about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, well, you don't get up and carry on about that all for the rest of your life. That's part of life. That's part of living. You know, you, we all have hard times that we're going to go through. My goodness. Give God the glory. Amen. We all go through stuff like that. Give God the glory. In spite of all of it, he's been good to me. Has he been good to you? Well, of course he has. So, here's what they say about Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what the Jehovah's Witnesses say about him. 
Jesus is not God. Before he lived on earth, he was Michael, the archangel. Jehovah made the universe through him. On earth, he was a man who lived a perfect life. After dying on a stake, not a cross, they get the starus, they wire that out, he was resurrected as a spirit. His body was destroyed. Jesus is not coming again. He returned invisibly in 1914 in spirit. Very soon, he and his angels will destroy all non-Jehovah's Witnesses. <coughs> is there anything in there that really exalts the Lord Jesus? No. No, it exalts their movement. Mormonism. Jesus is separate from God the Father, Elohim. He was created as a spirit child by the father and mother in heaven and is the elder brother of all men and spirit beings, including Lucifer. His body was created through sexual union between Elohim and Mary. Jesus was married. His death on the cross does not provide full atonement for all sin, but does provide everyone with resurrection. Now you say, this is shocking stuff. You need to remember when you deal with these people and you talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, they say Jesus and you say Jesus, you get into semantics. All right? They say Jesus, you say Jesus. You're not talking about saying Jesus. Their definition of God and your definition of God are two entirely different things. You've got to remember that. You can't carry on a conversation with somebody based on absolute truth where the two of you communicate with each other and the thing that you're talking about, you both understand to be that. No. They put their own spin on it. And so when I say God and they say God, when I say God, I'm talking about that eternal, absolute, one almighty being that is from everlasting to everlasting, that is invisible, that has never been seen, the creator of heaven and earth. There's none beside him. He is but one. Yet Father, Son, and Holy Ghost make up the Godhead. And the Godhead is the absolute essence of God in, in, in combined form, however you want to put it. And to understand the Trinity is beyond human ability. But I believe in it. And I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty walking on this earth 2,000 years ago. Not a God, not a creation of God, but He's God in every sense of the word. But He is the visible manifestation of that invisible being. He is the second person of the Godhead who walked on this earth. And this is why the Apostle says, In Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the Apostle Paul used terminology like that. He knew what he was talking about because he was, he was coming straight on. He was, he, this is a polemic. He's coming straight on against the Gnostics and telling them that the Lord Jesus Christ is not a created God, not a, not, a, not a representation of God, not an avatar, not an ascended master. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Amen. Almighty. And Orthodox Christians have always believed that. 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea, when Constantine convened that council, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea was because of Arianism. And Arianism had begun to, it had really grown. And where did Arianism come from? It came from Gnosticism. What is Arianism? Arianism is the doctrine that denies the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It teaches he's a created being. Now, it comes in different forms and flavors. Everything does. But basically, that's what it is. And so the Council of Nicaea, somebody come along and say, well, all these councils were Roman Catholic. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you read the Council of Nicaea? Have you read the, read the, read the, uh, the statement of the Council of Nicaea? Read it. I've read it many times. And I can't find one thing wrong with it. Now, there are other things that could have been added to it. But what was said is as straight down the line as can be said. And Constantine convened that council. And the reason he did is because he was... A Christian emperor. Theodosius was a Christian emperor. Constantine convened it, the Council of Nicaea, because he he's supposed to at the Milvian Bridge when he was when he was when he was fighting for control of the empire, he saw a cross in the in the heavens that said, "By this conquer," and so Constantine took that as a message from God, and he did conquer, and he became the undisputed. Uh, 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 leader of the empire, and that's when he he uh, he officially he officially ended Christian persecution and declared it to be a a viable religion. 
And that's why he called the Council of, of, of Nicaea. Now, do I know whether Constantine went to heaven or not? Well, I know this. I know the fruit of the Council of Nicaea as far as what they stated. Folks read it. It's right down the line. No problem with it. Now, they got the Council of Chalcedon, the Council of Tuz, all these other councils. Sure, you got them all piled up one on top of another. But you got to remember something. The early church was in a dogfight over the truth of who Christ was. And that's what this is all about today, you see. This, this Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism and all this stuff. This is nothing in the world more than a present manifestation of an ancient heresy. They attacked the deity of Christ. Why'd they do that? Well, they didn't hem-haw around. If you can destroy the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have put a, fight, a fatal blow to the church. Because the church is Christ. Christ is the church. This is his body. You're his body. And so the Council of Nicaea was for that purpose. To, he convened together the bishops, the bishop of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Antioch and the bishop of, uh, of Rome and the bishops of that day gathered them together. And they came in there and, 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 the, and, the, and the leading uh, religious leaders of the day and they hammered out this doctrine and they made it official that this is what Christians believe. Now to this day, People like Elaine Pagels and all that follow in her suit, and she's a professor of religion, all that follow along in that suit will say, well, Constantine created modern Christianity. You ever heard that one? Well, that's what they teach. They teach that real Christianity, the only way to find out what real Christians believed is to compare all of the material extant in the first century, which means the Gnostic Gospels, it means the Orthodox canon of Scripture, it also means the Jewish Apocrypha because it was extant at that time. It means taking all of the stuff. Well, why not go to Notovich and let's go see what the Hindus had to say. You know, why not just pile it all up together? You know what happened? The reason you cannot find, and you can't find, folks, as far as we know from everything that I've ever studied, learned from a Bible college or anywhere, there's not even as much as a speck of any of the original documents of the New Testament. Not even a piece, not even a, not even a, just a piece the size of a, of a dime. Doesn't exist as far as we know. When I say extant, that simply means that it's there. We know it exists. Why? And the reason why is because they read them and read them and passed them and read them and read them and passed them and read them and read them and God blessed them and God blessed them and He blessed them and they read them until they literally fell apart. And that's what I think. And so, therefore, they don't exist. But now, uh, at Sinai, there's a monastery, Mount Sinai, called St. Catherine's Monastery. And uh, I forget his name. The 1800s, he went down there. And it's a very prominent uh, tourist site if people had the money to go because it's Mount Sinai. And you've got, it's supposed to be anyway. Abu something they call it. And you've got this monastery there, and they found scrolls that had been thrown away, apparently. And they pulled them up, and they began to examine them, and they dated back to about the 2nd or 3rd century. And so they named them Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus. In other words, they named it after the mountain where it was found. Sinaiticus, they looked at this thing and they said, this is old. What are you doing throwing this away? This is old stuff. And I mean, after all, you know, if the older the better, don't you think? That's what's called provenance. You're, enabled, you're going to trace something back to its source. And so they find the Sinaiticus. And then they, the Vatican had what's called the Vaticanus. And then you had one called the Alexandrinus. And then you have all these unctuals and you have these curses and all of this stuff. And some of them are old, old, old. And they started reading it. They started translating it. It was in, in, in uh, I think, Sinaiticus is Greek. May have some Latin in it. But I, I, I can't remember. But they translated it. First thing you know, they began to build a Greek text from it. Then they laid it down next to the text of your New Testament. And they started seeing differences. Not the same. There's a lot of changes in places. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. Is that what your Bible says? What's your Bible say? God. Well, the Sinaiticus says he who. I think. 
Now I can, I can go to Nestle Allen's critical apparatus and I can take Nestle Allen's critical apparatus and I can go to every word in the New Testament and I can show you the manuscript evidence for every single word, whether it's in the text, out of the text, whatever, or a different, or a different change, whatever. So then uh, things got real interesting. They got real interesting. Because the more they got into that, the more they, they, the more they focused their attention on the Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus, the Alexandrinus, these uncials, these cursives, these lectionaries, and all of this stuff that compile, that put together, make up what call that great body of manuscript evidence. Something became glaringly obvious. So what's that, preacher? That there was an outside effect on it. And that effect was leading in the direction of, guess what? Gnosticism. Gnostics do not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. They don't believe that. They don't even believe in the Trinity. So without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. All right, now I get to this text. Now I'm a scribe. You didn't have Gutenberg back then, you know. I'm a scribe. So... Well, I don't like that. I know that the vast majority of the material available says Theos, but I'm going to change that to he who because we're not even really certain about who he was. So they changed it to he who. All right? They changed it to he who was manifest in the flesh. Well, he was manifest in the flesh, and that's okay, but that's not enough. See, there's more to it. Paul said God was manifest in the flesh. That's where the rub comes in. So we come along here 2,000 years later. We get a professor up here at Kent State University. And she's a very smart woman. And she uh, didn't know anything about manuscript evidence. But some of her students needed counseling from their professor. So she counseled with her students and she prayed with her students. She was a Christian. And she began to discover over time that the students that she prayed with and counseled with out of the different translations seemed to still be confused and didn't get a lot of help. But then she began to counsel and pray with them out of the King James Bible. And this was her own discovery. She said, I saw a difference. She said, I saw a profound difference. She said, my students started changing. They started getting help. In other words, she said, there was power in that book. <laughs> and so what she do? Well, she said about, and she's still at it, she said about uh, doing her own research into manuscript evidence. And we've got her book back here in the library, and it's called New Age Bible Versions. So why would she title it New Age Bible Versions? Because Gnosticism is the granddaddy of New Age. They're all based on the same thing. So... It's a simple thing. The first century after Christ, we've got a dogfight going on about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we've got a bunch of Gnostics over here that deny his deity. And then you've got the Orthodox believers like Irenaeus and Tertullian and the rest of them who are fighting them. And they're writing books called Against Heresies and stuff like that. And they go, to they go head to head. And we read about that now. We can see their work. And we appreciate it. Because 2,000 years ago, you had brothers and sisters in the Lord who stood for this book, who earnestly contended for the faith that's once delivered to the saints. But this stuff still filters down. So you got a Jehovah's Witness. Every time I go by their place, I go by their place every day. I look over there and I say, you poor people. <laughs> At least they don't call it a church. <laughs> because it's not a church. What do they call it? Kingdom Hall, yeah. No. <laughs> Uh, the Unification Church, here's what they say. Jesus was a perfect man, not God. He is the son of Zechariah, not born of a virgin. His mission was to unite the Jews behind him, find a perfect bride, and begin a perfect family. The mission failed. Jesus did not resurrect physically. The second coming of Christ is fulfilled in sun, moon, sun, moon, moon. We call them moonies. Remember them? who is superior to Jesus and will finish Jesus' mission. Boy, you talk about, uh, you talk about eat up with narcissism. <laughs> Man. 
And uh, they really believe that. Have you noticed something all of them seem to have in common? He's not God. See that? They may have their own little spin on it. Sometimes the spin's cultural. Sometimes it has to do with their place in history. Sometimes the spin for their own personal because they want to build their own part of the religion up. But it's still the same spin. Because once you acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as God Almighty, then you know there's only one sacrifice for the sin of man. And if God's Son died on that cross, there can't be anything better than that. And they have to deal with that. And they're not going to do with it. Here's Christian science. Jesus was not the Christ, but a man who displayed the Christ idea. Now we're getting into mysticism. Christ means perfection, not a person. Christ means the anointed of God. But Mary Baker Patterson Glover Eddy, who started the Christian science movement, was teaching people that Christ means perfection, not a person. See what I mean? This is Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the Lord Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus 2,000 years ago, had a spirit come on him at his anointing at the, at, at the, sea of, at, at the, at the Jordan River and stayed on him till he died on the cross and right before he died it left him. Now that's what they're teaching and they're still teaching this stuff. And these people resurrect this garbage. People like Mary Baker Patterson, Glover Eddy, the Sun Moon, the, the Mooney Church, the Mormonism started by Joseph Smith, Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Taz Russell. These people resurrect this old stuff, put their own spin on it, repackage it for their, for their generation, and come across like they have some great knowledge about something. Oh my, come and listen to me because I can really tell you who Jesus is. I don't have a clue who he is. And they're not, a, they're not teaching a thing that wasn't everywhere in the first century. See what I'm saying? All they're doing is rehashing old garbage. Uh, but of course, people never stop because they love that attention. Here's the new age. You need to get this one. Jesus is not the one true God. Have you ever had a new ager tell you they were a Christian? You will. Jesus is not the one true God. He's not a savior, but a spiritual model and guru. And is now an ascended master. He was a new ager who tapped into divine power in the same way that anyone can. Notovich. Many believe he went east to India or Tibet and learned mystical truths. He did not rise physically from the dead, but rose into a higher spiritual realm. What have they done? They've denied the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. They've denied the blood atonement. That's what they've done. That's what every one of them have done. Every one of them. Christ died for your sins, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel, according to the scriptures. He was buried. Then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ, according to the scriptures. They teach that he swooned. A lot of the Jews were teaching that. They came out with a book called The Passover Plot. And the thesis of The Passover Plot is that Christ swooned. He really didn't die. And that Christianity was born from the fact that he appeared to die on the cross, but he really didn't. And so they raised, his, raised him up and, uh, and they healed him and, and, and Christianity was born from that. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see the connection in all of it. That's what you look for. Is, is, uh, is Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism... Unification, Christian science, New Age, are they connected? Absolutely. They're all connected. They're connected. So that means they have a common source. Here's Wicca. Jesus is either rejected altogether or sometimes considered a spiritual teacher who taught love and compassion. What's Wicca? Wicca is just simply another name for what? Witchcraft. You need to remember this about witchcraft, and this is what draws them into it. This is, the, this is the important thing about witchcraft. They believe by manipulation and using of, of, uh, of oils or incense or crystals or, or earth objects or earth things that they can manipulate the future. They can change things for their own benefit. A witch is somebody who thinks that they are able to alter the course of events. 
And therefore, a witch can bring prosperity on themselves if they want so and so for a mate, if they want this man or this woman, they can bring, they can put them under a spell and bring them to themselves. That's what witchcraft's about. It's about control and power. And that's what it's, that, that's, that's what, that's what's a big deal. Yeah. But, wit, but witchcraft is not new. <laughs> Saul, King Saul of Israel, about uh, would put him probably uh, where? Somewhere about uh, 900 B.C. Uh, no, he'd be before he before that. He'd be he'd be before 1000 B.C. He'd be about he'd be 1050 B.C. Somewhere in there, he went to Endor and conjured and conjured up trying to conjure up Samuel, and he used a witch. And you know what he'd done before that? He had driven all the witches out of the land. And uh, she was left, and he knew it, and he went there. So witchcraft's been around a long time. The Bible warns them in the Old Testament, don't you mess with witches, leave them alone. Stay away from that stuff. Say, well, it's just superstition, preacher, you know. I mean, after all, they're just poor old people. They don't know any better, and they're just doing the best they can. Folks, the power is either of God or Satan. It's a real spiritual power. Don't kid yourself. It's a real spiritual power. If a witch can, she'll put a curse on you. And if she can put a curse on you, that curse will come to pass if you don't have the power of God on you. And if you have the power of God on you and you've been blessed, you can't be cursed. And they'll do it if they can. But the problem is that if you're born again, that curse will go right back on their head. Amen. They conjure up something and have to deal with it. I don't even know what the word genius means. You say, hear the word, you say the word genius, you think of who? Al Einstein, right? How many of you ever seen Einstein's desk? A photograph of his desk. It's quite a remarkable thing. It really is. How many of you ever seen that? They took a photograph of Einstein's desk, I think a day passed away or the week or somewhere, near, near that time. He ought to see it. Just type in Einstein's desk. It looks like my desk. <laughs> Can't find anything. Piled up all over the place. He was not organized. But he's considered a genius. What does the word genius mean then? What does it mean? Super intelligent, right? Einstein's IQ was probably 200 or better. 210, 220. So what does that mean? The average IQ is about 100. About 100. And when you get above 100, then you start getting into the smart people. Mensa starts at about 135, 140, somewhere in there. Uh, they say that Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, has an IQ of 160. He's a very smart man. All right. But the word genius, believe it or not, shows up in the old writings 2,000 years ago. A genius in Latin. All right. And the word demon shows up 2,000 years ago all over the place in Greek. And they both essentially meant the same thing. What they mean? In Latin, a genius was a spirit that inhabited your house and places you went to. It was a spirit that you called on to protect you and give you divine knowledge. The idea was you're getting this knowledge from the divine, from the divinities. Now remember, when I'm talking about God with Romans, I'm talking about millions of them. <laughs> well, let's say, say thousands anyway. And when we come to the Greeks... They believe that a demon represented spirits from the golden age of Greece going all the way back, uh, back all the way before Plato, going back to the Titans. The, the golden age of Greece was the time of Greece when they had the greatest power, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And they believed in five separate ages, the Greeks did, Five of them, and each successive age was lower than the previous age. In other words, man was not evolving intellectually, he was devolving intellectually. So 2,000 years ago, the idea was that if I can have a demon, then I'm going to tap into the wisdom of the golden age, the previous ages, see? So in other words, to have a demon was a good thing in Greek culture. Good thing. Now remember, folks, please, please, please. 
Don't judge the word and the usage of the word in 2018 to the way it was used 2,000 years ago. The New Testament has the word demon in it over and over and over and over and over again. But have you ever taken a concordance and tried to find the word demon in your New Testament text? Have you ever done that? Can, you, can anybody in here this morning tell me where the word demon shows up in the New Testament? Where? It's not in there. You won't find the word. What's that mean? It means that the King James translators, when they came to the word demon, they didn't refer back to the golden age of Greece and the wisdom of the Titans. They translated it evil spirit or unclean spirit or spirit of this or spirit of that. The New Testament never one time ever set the word demon in a good context. When they translated that, it, and, and the reason they translated it that way is because of the way it's used in the New Testament, the context of it. So when they translate it, they translate it in a bad context. What's that tell you? That tells you that when God Almighty wrote his New Testament, he wrote it in the face of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the culture of the day, completely different than the way they saw things and the way God sees things. See, that's what it tells you. When you deal with, uh, how many's ever heard of Alfred Edersheim? I'm going to run out of time. Alfred Edersheim, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Go to the back of it. Go to the back of his book. And you'll have a section there on Jewish demonology. Jewish demonology. It's the mo one of the most enlightening things you've ever read in your life. Jewish demonology ran practically the same as... Babylon, the Greeks, and all the rest of them, the Jewish demonology was highly tainted by occultism in their day 2,000 years ago. How do you get this? You get most of it out of the Babylonian Talmud, the way it's used in there. Not all of it now, but most of it. What does that tell you? It tells you that even though the men who wrote the New Testament were Jews, they were completely free of the, of, the, of the ignorance, the occultism, the perversion, and everything in their culture of that day. That is another one of those proofs that the New Testament is inspired of God because it is completely different from the world that they lived in. And the genius, the Latin, the Roman, he had shrines, he had temples. The average Roman house would have a shrine to their forefathers, ancestral worship. They, had, they, they believed that this genius was a spirit that was with them to help them. And their relationship with the gods was mostly based on the fact that what can, you, what can this God do for me? What kind of a, an agreement can I come to with this God? The Romans would incorporate the gods of, their, of, of everybody else around them. If they, if they defeated uh, the Etruscans, they'd incorporate their gods. If they, if they, if they defeated the... Uh, uh, what was that place in North Africa? The, Partha, the, uh, Carthag the Carthaginians. They'd incorporate their gods. They incorporated all the gods around them. It didn't make a difference what you believed as long as you would accept this one thing. The cult, the imperial cult of Rome. You know what that was? A Pontifus Maximus. When Julius Caesar became the Caesar by his own name, the appellation Caesar became the Caesar of Rome. He changed it from what it had been into a republic, a republic with senators, a republic with a government governing it. His successor, which was Octavian, wasn't his son, but it was his nephew, second nephew, something like that. His successor inherited that republic from Julius Caesar, but his, his successor's name was Augustus, and you know what he did with it? He turned it into an empire. So it went from the Republic of, Caesar, of, of Julius Caesar to the empire of Augustus Caesar. And they spread that empire as far as they possibly could. And when Pontius Pilate stood up to the Lord Jesus Christ and talked to him face to face, the Lord Jesus Christ said, For this cause have I come into to the earth to bear witness to the truth. All right, now you're going to get the foundation of relativism. 
when he said to Pontius Pilate, I came to bear witness to the truth. What did Pilate say back to him? What is truth? In other words, is there really an absolute truth? That's the foundation for us, folks. There is an absolute truth. It's that book. If you stay in the world of relativism, you are in the New Age movement, you're a Hindu, you're a Buddhist, you're all the rest of it, you're the Gnostic Gospels, you're the whole mess, you're the crowd that Tertullian and Irenaeus were fighting against in the first century, you are a relativist. You do not believe in absolute anything. You believe that one day you'll become something with the Pleroma up here and, and Plato's monad, and, and that's, that's what your hope is for eternity. Sanctify them through thy truth, the Lord Jesus said. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Thy word is truth.